Hello all, my name is Algernon Austin. I'm the Director for Race and Economic Justice at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. The Center for Economic and Policy Research, also known as CEPR, was established to promote democratic de debate on the most important economic and social issues that affect people's lives. Welcome to the first installment of our four-part series commemorating the 60th anniversary of the March in Washington for Jobs and Freedom. These events are brought to you by the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR, as part of the Full Employment for All Coalition. You can find out more about the coalition at fullemploymentforall.org. The Full Employment for All Coalition is working to bring attention to the need for a national subsidized employment program targeted to high unemployment communities. For example, in the first quarter of this year, the unemployment rate in the Bronx, New York was twice the national average. The rates in Flint, Michigan and McGuffin County, Kentucky were three times the national average. The rate in Porterville, California was four times the national average. There are many, many more communities facing high rates of joblessness right now we can create jobs in these communities and foster their economic development. Before we begin our great panel today on the forgotten history of the March for Jobs and Freedom, I want to remind you that we have three other great panels for you over the next three Wednesdays this month. Please register for next week's panel on the continuing struggle for jobs on the CEPR website at cepr.net if you have not done so already. The moderator for today's panel is Dr. Carol Lottier, who is the Director of Movement Building at the Demos Think Tank. And I'll now hand it off to Carol. Many thanks, uh, Algernon. And I am excited to introduce our panelists today. Uh, William P. Jones, professor of history at the University of Minnesota and author of The March on Washington, Jobs, Freedom, and the Forgotten History of Civil Rights. Tanya, uh, Tanya Wallace-Gobern, executive director of the National Black Worker Center, and Reverend Nelson B. Rivers III, vice president of religious affairs and external relations of the National Action Network, and pastor of Charity Missionary Baptist Church, in North Charleston, South Carolina. Welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you. You know, August 28th of this year will mark the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Many people only know about Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech from that march, but the history and significance of the march itself entails much more than just the speech. This panel will delve into the history of the march and also discuss what lessons the march has for activism today. So I'd like to begin with uh, a question, just recognizing that many people are not aware that the title of the march included the phrase for jobs and freedom. Who were the organizers of the original march, uh, of that march, and why did they want it to be for jobs and freedom? I can start with that. Um, the, the, the march was, of course, a built by a broad, a very broad coalition, which is why it was so big. It was a, a coalition of civil rights organizations, black women's organizations, uh, trade unions, um, and, and, and religious organizations primarily. Uh, but it was initiated by the Negro American Labor Council, which was a national network of several thousand uh, black trade unionists. It was led by A. Philip Randolph, who had actually initiated the first idea for the March on Washington back during the Second World War in 1941. And the trade unionists came together uh, starting in 1960 around concern about rising levels of Black unemployment and underemployment and poverty. And this, in many respects, was a situation that was similar to the one we face today. The U.S. economy was actually growing very rapidly. It was a period of, it was still within um, a really booming economy. Uh, but what they observed was that the combination of uh, discrimination against Black workers, unequal access to education, uh, and the transformation of the economy. They, 
pointed out that automation and the ex exporting of manufacturing jobs were eliminating jobs that black workers had just gotten access to, were just getting access to that. So they argued that something needed to be done about this uh, immediately. They called for a federal law banning employment discrimination. Uh, they called for raising the minimum wage. They identified that as $2 an hour, which in today's terms would be about $20 an hour. And they called for a federal jobs creation program that would create dignified and meaningful jobs at decent wages for all workers who wanted them. Um, so that was the initial idea for the march. It was actually later expanded from a march for jobs to a march for jobs and freedom. And of course, the idea behind freedom being incorporating the demands of the Southern Civil Rights Movement, access to voting rights, access to uh, e equal access to schools and government services and public accommodations. Thank you, Will. Um, I'll move to the next question. It sounds like the leaders of the march knew that our economy and democracy are inextricably linked, that uh, both ballot access and economic power are needed to build an inclusive democracy and just economy. So in light of uh, your response, I'm curious what, you, what you'd say people misunderstand about the march and why the emphasis on jobs often seems to be lost in dominant narratives of this historic event. Right. Well, I think it's fair to say that the thing that most people understand about the march and know about the march is um, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, um, it, which was is a tremendously powerful uh, speech. There's a reason why it's um, actually the most recognized piece of rhetoric in American history. Um, so it's and it's recognized around the world as a tremendously powerful speech. But when we focus just solely on that speech, we forget that it was actually the last of 10 speeches. And the reason why it was last was that they knew that he was sort of hit it out of the park. Um, it, it, nobody wanted to follow him, right? So they put him last because they knew that he would send people home inspired and uplifted and ready to go home and to continue fighting. But what he didn't actually have to say in the last speech was why they were there. So if you listen to the speech, it's actually very vague about, you know, it has this uplifting, powerful message about his dream, but it doesn't say specifically what were the demands of the march. And that was actually because the people who came before him said it over and over and over again. Um, when he left the stage, uh, A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin, the, prim the primary organizer of the march, came back on stage and read the full list of the demands of the march. Um, so if we if we only listen to Dr. King's speech, we get a very powerful speech, but we learn actually very little about what the goals of the march were. We um, and I think it's important to remember to uh, that there were ten demands of the march. Um, they included a, a new civil rights law that was included very strict and powerful federal enforcement of racial equality. Uh, the withholding of federal funds from any program that discriminated on the basis of race. Uh, the desegregation of all school districts in 1963, right? This was, uh, this was August, so they didn't give them much time, right? By the end of the year. Uh, the enforcement of the 14th Amendment, including reducing congressional representative representation of states where citizens are disfranchised. Um, a federal ban on uh, housing discrimination. Um, so, the, so they were they were asking for a very powerful set of federal civil rights laws, in addition to the what we might think of as the jobs demands, the jobs for job creation, uh, the raising of the minimum wage, the extension of the minimum wage to all workers. So, agricultural workers, for example, in the United States still are not covered uh, by federal minimum wage laws. Um, many domestic workers are not covered by federal minimum wage laws. So they were pointing out that all workers needed these uh, protections. Um, and of course, the what they called at the time the FEPC law or the Fair Employment Practices Law, um, which would be part of the, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, Title VII, uh, which prohibits employment discrimination. Um, so I think it's the, the primary misunderstanding is that 
we don't actually really know in the popular imagination why so many people were there, right? Why were people um, participating in that demonstration? Carol, if I could jump in, you know, one of the things yes. that I think was also um, missing is uh, an accounting of the countless number of women who helped to shape and make the, the march possible. Two such women that come to mind are Dorothy Height and Anna Hedgeman. They were the only two women who held official titles on the planning committee. Dorothy Height is the godmother of the civil rights movement. She was also the president of the National Council of Negro Women. She was the only female member of the March, March organizers. And Anna Hedgeman was with the National Council of Tr um, Churches and was the only woman on the events administrative committee. And if people know anything about Dorothy Height, they know that she mobilized movements that were focused on ending lynching, restructuring the criminal justice system, and increasing voter registration in the South. And so for the March on Washington, she organized thousands of women volunteers. She arranged transportation to the march and lent her expertise on suffrage and segregation topics. Um, and as for Anna Hedgeberg, and Hedgeman, excuse me, in 1944, she became the executive director of the National Council for Permanent Fair Employment Practices Committee. She led the fight against um, employment discrimination and was the first black woman in the New York uh, mayoral cabinet in 1954. And so for black women, opportunities for equal work and pay were even scarcer. Additionally, the racist and sexist attitudes of the time made it difficult for them to advocate for their needs and safety inside and outside of the movement. And so I would say that for these Black women in particular, the March for Jobs and Freedom was needed to counter the systemic disenfranchisement that was plaguing um, the Black community. And one of the things that doesn't get lifted up in, in history books, right, is the role that, that women played and how important um, these bills were for equality, not just for, for the Black men, but for Black women. Thanks so um, much, uh, uh, Dr. Rivers. Uh, yeah, sorry, Reverend Rivers, go ahead. Thank you, I appreciate all the perspective. I'm really glad to participate. Ironically or divinely, I am in Jackson, Mississippi right now. Um, tomorrow, I'm meeting with local clergy about the March on Washington anniversary that's being held by the Drum Major Institute, being led by Dr. King's son, Martin III, and his wife, um, Andrea, and Reverend Sharpton, who I work with. And we're meeting to talk about how Medgar's assassination helped increase the participation and focus because Medgar was the first uh, popular um, civil rights person of that era to be shot to death for nothing more than everything you talked about that's being demanded by the march. Also, it depends on the lens um, through which you look at the march and where you're from. I was born in South Carolina. Um, when Mega was killed, I was 12. I asked my mother uh, why they kill him based on the Life magazine cover. And she said, because he was trying to help colored people. And I said at the age of 12, well, I want to help colored people. And unbeknownst to me, 22 years later, I was the same thing. And South Carolina with NAACP that Mega was in Mississippi. I was a South Carolina field secretary. For us in the South, and I hate to speak with that broad brush, and NAACP, I had a, a peculiar, unique view of the march because there were many of the people, lieutenants, um, officers, the ground troops who did the work, as King referred to them, who were still around. And they all shared their perspective. I had a chance to meet Mr. Randolph uh, uh, early, well, just before he, he he died uh, and listen to him speak about it. I also had a chance to work with, with, uh, with John Lewis to talk about um, some of the politics that went on. And then the whole women thing that the sister just raised up. You understand that at first they didn't want any women. Uh, one of the big fights inside the march was, uh, and it became the big whatever that number was because they had to expand it because the boys had decided women couldn't play. Septima Clark, Ella Baker, Dorothy Height and others had to come and confront them about this. Um, and the point about Dr. King's great speech and why it was so effective as a preacher, Dr. King did not plan to preach, at least he didn't write a sermon. He was going to just do a very 
detail, or at least a, a detail on why this was important, almost from an academic perspective. He stayed up to four o'clock in the morning to write the speech. But Mahalia Jackson, who understood this ain't working, Martin, you're going to have to go home. You're going to have to turn and go preach. And Mahalia said, tell him about the dream, Martin, that worked because he had just done that in June in, or July in, um, in Detroit. One of the things that we don't think about the march, that was the first time something that big happened with that many speakers. And they had the trouble adjusting to the fact that you would make the sound. You don't know what was said because it would take a while for it to come back. So King was talking about how, and, and Mahalia made this point, that Martin, that thing worked in Detroit. There are 100,000 people. So turn to the dream and you can hear it literally because we study it as preachers. There's a moment when he goes from his written text to just going home, as we call it in the Baptist church, any church. And he started going home and it's going home part that got remembered because he used all the stuff that he's been equipped with as unique um, preacher and speaker to do that. Why I think you may think that they didn't pay attention, but everything that the march was about was Southern for us. Everything that was missing, everything we didn't have, that was articulated in our day-to-day -day lives. As a 12-year-old, I understood that. As I got older, I understood it even more. So much so that when I talked to Ms. Clark, Septima Clark, who we call Seppi, who was a, Dr. King called her the mother of the movement, but she was also very, she was a feminist par excellence, and she had a lot of fighting inside SELC and the movement about the role of women or the lack thereof. The money part, the jobs part was real clear in my part of the world. We really, un we understood this because the discrimination, the abject poverty, the kind of stuff my community went through, my father having to work three jobs, my mother uh, as a school teacher never got paid any kind of real money. So the, the, the march for us in South Carolina, and as I visited, I was also the regional director for NAACP for Southeast. So Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee were my states. I spent most of my time in those states. And everyone had a perspective on the march about a hallelujah moment that shed light on something that we thought was not understood across America, because there were two Americas, not just in the South, of course, but in the South is where we felt the two Americas the very most. The jobs part was intentionally lost, I think, in some ways because of the strategy around trying to prepare for 64 and the Civil Rights Act. But the truth is, uh, our perspective in the South was we were really clear what that was about. And that's why there were so many folk who did everything they could to come. It got lost in translation because outside of the movement, folk didn't talk about it because of something else to claim their attention. You know, right after people forget this, but the four little girls were killed in Birmingham in response to the march. And, and Medgar was killed because Kennedy gave the speech about making black folk equal and Byron Dealer Beck was shot him that night of the speech that Do uh, John, John Kennedy gave. That was in our mind, we understood. So even as a young person, so when the march happened, the reason we were riveted by King's speech is because we only remember the sermon part. And he didn't preach very long. He preached at the end. And the preaching, as any good preacher does, he summarized everything you wanted to do when he was going home, when she goes home, and that's what he did. And that's why people remember, you go back and listen to it as I do often. He did have some very strong notes about why the march happened. That's why people remember. It's not remember it just a good sermon. In fact, folks don't call it a sermon. I don't know why they call it a speech. But at the end, he summarized, I think, very powerfully what the march was about. The politics is not talked about. And Mr. Jones, I didn't get a chance to read the book yet. I'm looking forward. But I talked to E.D. Nixon. I talked to the folk in, in Montgomery. I had a chance to sit down with them as they recounted what happened around it. And I talked to the folk at NACP who I worked with for all 38 years and everybody has a perspective. But one of the things folk don't talk about is the march was almost a miracle because at the rate they were fighting each other and the stuff they were going through, there was at one point a question whether this thing is going to happen. And A. Philip Randolph would not let them forget that he really originally tried to do this against Roosevelt. And he tried to do it by telling Roosevelt, if you don't live up to this, I'm going to bring all these folk to D.C. It didn't happen. But he said, he said in 63, y'all ain't going to stop me this time. We're going to do this march. Because he had a lot of folk who were trying to tell him, don't mess with Kennedy. He's our friend. He ain't right. going, we're going, we're going right. to upset him and all that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, That's you're fine. I, I really appreciate all of that history. It's so rich.
And uh, you, you're reminding me, uh, uh, Reverend Rivers, that there's a unique intersection here uh, that, that Dr. King's speech, right, brought inspiration, it referenced faith, right? It, it referenced values, uh, American ideals, and coupled them with these economic, this economic uh, platform uh, that was being advanced that uh, Will just shared. I'm curious, you've already touched on some of this, but were there other major, major challenges to organizing the march? And uh, I guess for today, how different or similar uh, challenges are, are folks facing now to organize around jobs and freedom in the current moment? One of the biggest problems, I'll leave this to uh, Mr. Jones and thank you, um, Tanya. The, one of the biggest fights was who's gonna speak when and who's gonna be on the program. And, that's, and unfortunately in 2023, if you have a march, you fight over the same thing. And, and John Lewis had to make he had to fight to be able to be on, on the program. They they didn't say, uh, well, let Lewis speak. Um, and then they, it, they were, I mean, there was tension between Wilkins and, and Martin over his strategies. And this was an issue about the march, whether, uh, as you said, they wanted him to come last, but not everybody did. Because whoever is last, that's what gets remembered they close out the march. And there was some folk who really did not want King to come last because they differed about his direct action strategies. That was some of the internal stuff that folk literally told us about, including Bayard uh, Rushton, who had a couple of conversations that I'm privy to by listening. And he talked about some of what some of what went down. And I'm amazed that even as we do marches now, and we have one on 26th of August, uh, the commemoration, not a commemoration, but a continuation of the struggle, I invite you to come, will be in Washington on the 26th of of August. And even then, some of that's going to be about who will speak and when will they speak. Very helpful. Uh, Tanya or Will? Sure. You know, I think um, one of the things that, that people don't talk about was that Malcolm X ridiculed the march because of its non-violent integrationalist approach. Um, at the time, he called it the farce on Washington. He condemned mm -hmm. Black civil rights activists for collaborating with whites and accepting donations from whites. Um, Boehner Rustin, um, though he was one of the main organizers of the march, was concerned that it would turn violent and damage the in, uh, international reputation of the civil rights movement. President Kennedy was opposed to the march and he discouraged people to participate in it. It was very clear that the establishment wanted the march to be a failure. The media, um, as even we see this play out today, was full of dire predictions that there was going to be violence. And so there were a lot of rumors that happened also that spread fear. There were rumors that the airlines wouldn't allow people or black groups of people onto the planes, that um, trains that went up the East Coast to Washington, D.C. were going to shut down, that buses built with Black folks would not cross Southern state lines, that um, Alabama state troopers would stop Black people if they were going to Washington by arresting or beating or killing them. And, and churchgoers weren't sure if they should take part in the protest. So I think one of the, the main um, tactics that were used and challenges that people experienced was fear. And we see that tactic playing out as people attempt to mobilize today. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with all of those. I, I think, I mean, the, there was the, I, I think we, in part because the march was so big and so successful, I think we've forgotten how at the time it was perceived as extremely dangerous and extremely threatening. The, the government, um, they, they shut down the federal government on the day. Um, they shut down, uh, they, they moved all of the prisoners out of uh, prisons in Washington, D.C., uh, in anticipation that they would have mass arrests and they would need that space. Um, they staged troops across the river in Arlington with helicopters ready to bring them in uh, to the march. So the, the idea was that this was a very threatening uh, demonstration uh, that the government was terrified of. And I think because we now have very large kind of regular marches on Washington, the, the, we don't see it as in that way. Um, I would say, and there was also the um, the the infighting that was um, differences of opinion. Um, the the idea of a mass march itself was very uh, 
seen as very dangerous by many uh, civil rights leaders. The NAACP was very reluctant to um, sign on to the demonstration, uh, feeling that this would turn ugly and violent. Um, but I think the biggest thing that we don't remember is just the difficulty of getting a quarter million people to Washington. This was on a weekday. So people took time off work. Um, unions actually, in some cases, negotiated uh, time off for people to be able to travel to Washington. Um, and it demonstrated, I think, I think that we forget the, the, the networks that were important for mobilizing people. So these were these trade union networks, the civil rights organization networks. I think the most important, as Tanya pointed to, were the Black women's networks that were um, rooted in cities across the country. These Black women's clubs, the National Association of Black Women's Clubs, um, was in many respects the largest civil rights organization. In the 1960, they had 800,000 members in cities across the country. And so these were organizations that could actually put out the word, get their members there. They could organize the buses and the trains um, to actually bring people to Washington. And that is a logistical uh, challenge that, uh, that was faced, um, that was really on display that day, um, the degree to which Black people could actually mobilize and, and uh, get people to Washington on that day. And would you say that uh, the organizers of the march achieved what they hoped for? Uh, did they see the march as a success? I think that it exceeded their expectations. I think for many of them, they were stunned that that many people could get there. As Dr. Jones just said, the big problem was how to get to D.C., how to get that many folk to D.C. Um, you know, one of the reasons Minister, uh, Minister Farrakhan ended up having the Million Million Man March was because he was excluded from the 30th anniversary. And he said, if y'all can do 250, I can do a million. And people laughed at him, like, really? And he did, I was there. So, but the, the big thing about the march, the validation came because one, it was a crowd that was bigger than they thought would come. Two, it went off without a hitch. And three, the most iconic, memorable, public address in the history of America was given. And it got bigger years later. But going into the march, if they had gotten 100,000 people, they would have been happy. If they had got through that without violence, they would have celebrated. And to get that many people from all over the, the world, all over the country to come, especially the Southern contingent that came, that was near a miracle because we were still behind the segregation curtain. I mean, in 63, it was tough being a Black person in the South. Um, and even ride up the highway. The threats were not just intimidation strategy. That's a real threat. When people tell you the highway patrol and the police, every white police officer is deputized in the South to kill a black person on site without any kind of worry about going to jail or even being tried. That's a real thing. So the courage of the marchers should not be minimized. It was really a, a major undertaking. A lot of people uh, uh, Jess used to say that for as many folk who claimed to have been at the march were at the march, we wouldn't have any room for them. Because everybody in mama was at the march now, but at the time it was it was tough. But if everybody who said we're at the march would have been five million people, because I talk to folk all the time who tell me they were at the march. I couldn't lie because I was 12. <laughs> but a lot of folk, when I did the math, they would have been too. I said, you couldn't have been at the march, bro. But anyway, if you say you were, maybe your mama went, took you with her. But they, they exceeded the expectation. There was some and Jones can speak to this, there were some after effects that went to bragging rights, who really did the work, uh, who gets credit. And it was really the aftermath of this tension going into the march. But I think to an organization in person, the march probably was the most successful public demonstration of freedom and justice up to that time that had ever been done. Thank you. Other thoughts on uh, whether the organizers uh, thought it was a success? Say that they they definitely thought it was um saw it as a success because as Reverend said, Reverend Nelson said, just the, the sheer numbers, I would add to it the, the media coverage that took place. Um, I would also add that it was a national event, right? So there were people from, from the north, from the Midwest, from the West Coast, from the South, from across the country who heard the call. I um I remember my dad would tell us um, stories about how every day in school they would get 
some kind of news about this march that was happening. And so, you know, there wasn't the internet then or Twitter or anything like that, but the way that the messages were able to permeate um, throughout so many communities throughout the country clearly was a success. And because they were able to mass so many people to get so many, um, so much media coverage to have such a, a large event and have it be nonviolent, that got the that got the attention of, of of our political leaders at that time. I think that's what helped to um, you know create the success of the civil rights bill. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think T Tanya mentioned the civil rights bill, and I, I guess I point to that as a really important outcome of the march. Um, before the march, uh, Reverend Rivers mentioned uh, uh, President Kennedy's speech. Um, before Medgar Evers was killed. And in that speech, he called for a civil rights law. Um, but the civil rights law that he called for was pretty different from the one that ended up being passed in 1964. Um, the biggest difference was that uh, Kennedy did not support a fair employment practices law, um, a, a, a law prohibiting employment discrimination. And that was a central demand of the march. And the march had the effect of putting together a broad coalition that was dedicated to actually adding that to the bill. Um, so the AFL-CIO, the Labor Federation, did not support the march. They did not endorse the march. Um, but after the march, they, in part out of uh, embarrassment, um, some pointed out that this was probably the biggest march of union members in American history. Um, and they came on board with uh, an effort to pass the civil rights law and to add the fair employment provision to it. So that would become Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And importantly, this get, goes back to uh, the question of the exclusion of women uh, from the march. Um, many of the Black women who were involved in that march, as Tanya pointed out, made the argument that Black women needed that law against employment discrimination more than anyone, right? And they said, we need a law that not only uh, prohibits employment discrimination based on race, but also employment discrimination based on gender. And that's actually one of the reasons why that the Civil Rights Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, includes that prohibition uh, on employment discrimination, not just against by race, uh, but also by gender. And that's a pretty direct uh, outcome of, of the march. It, it wasn't... Uh, the, in the official demands of the march, but it certainly grew out of the of Black women's response to being excluded from leadership of the march. Thanks for all of those responses. Uh, so when you think about the intersection of jobs, uh, material well-being, and freedom, uh, that is both agency and sovereignty, uh, how does the 1963 march inform your work and uh, what are some lessons that you think we should be applying today? Well, for me, the um, since I still do this work, uh, for me, the march became a model and still serves as a model for how to do it. Um, the value of direct action became manifested in that march. There were a lot of folk who questioned the, the idea of direct action, still do, uh, but at National Action Network, we know direct action works. When I was with NACP, we knew that it worked. And this march on the 26th of August is really about direct action over current issues that were current issues during the march 60 years ago. So I want to I invite folk to, um, to hit us in the chat if they want to participate. The number I would leave if somebody can capture 646-629-1684, 646-629-1684. Sixteen eighty four about the march. If you want to come on the bus or something, let us know. But to answer that question, people use the march as a model of how to organize. Uh, a lot of lessons learned about being parade leaders, being marshals. Go back to the, the march. A lot of folk were trained how to do it with the march, and because there were so many organizations, it validated direct action across the spectrum of organizations. But before that. That was seen, and Dr. King was very controversial because he believed in direct action. NAACP would run out the room you start talking about doing direct action. But after the march, it became a staple of the field organizing of the NAACP, as it is now with us with the National National Network. So I would, I would argue 
that the march was so successful that it served as a model for people even today on one, being inclusive, two, learning the lesson that women were not treated fairly then, and now I'm glad that women don't have to wait on us uh, to treat them fairly, they just <laughs> make sure it's done. And you can do direct action without worrying about the violence being caused by your side of the issue. Those things happen now without, without people talking about it, but the march was the first time it really was done on that scale. Thank you, Reverend. I think one of the, the lessons that I learned is that we are not just dreamers, but we are doers. And the reality mm. is, is that the United States is a work in progress. We take a step forward and a step backwards every single day. And that fact doesn't excuse anyone everywhere from working to right wrongs, whether on a national scale or a local level. Our current crisis pick a crisis, fill it a blank with whatever your crisis is, there is an urgency that we cannot deny that requires us to take action. Um, that's my one of my learns from the civil rights movement. The other is that a small group of dedicated, passionate, courageous, and determined men and women confronted a monolithic system of entrenched injustice, and they won. The freedom fighters, and the civil rights activists were willing to be attacked by dogs, sprayed with fire hoses, to be beaten, to go to jail, to have their dignity and their very lives threatened, and they did not back down. Their courage was, for me, equal parts humbling and inspiring. Those are the shoulders that we stand on now, and this is the legacy that we are called to tap into. Um, you know, uh, Reverend Nelson talked about the um, our, our human rights being um, um, acknowledged and the right to protest. One of the things that we see happening across the country is those rights to, to assemble, those rights to march, those rights to protest being attacked in cities all across the country. And they're being attacked because marching and protesting and demonstrating works. When we march, when we assemble in that manner, it is an acknowledgement of our human rights, of our dignity that cannot be denied, that cannot be ignored. And so that is a testament to the success of the March on Washington, the assembly of those people and the reason that, and that that, that ability to assemble is being attacked now is proof that assembly works and that that march was successful. Yeah, just to add to that, I think, I mean, this actually goes back to uh, when A. Philip Randolph organ called for the first March on Washington in 1941, he said that we need to build a mass movement that involves everybody, regardless of their walk of life. If you, you know, if you want to win a court case, you should probably be a lawyer, right? And if you're going to go to Congress and lobby them, you know, it, you, you have to be, have somebody who has these connections. But he said anybody can mark, can participate in a march. It doesn't matter their background. And I think that Actually, you can see that in the March on Washington. I mean, it was it was a march of 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 factory workers, of farm workers, of domestic workers, of teachers, of city employees um, from across the country, and it was a it was a it was a demonstration that can involve people who did not have a, a high level of education, um, who did not have a lot of money, um, and were able to to get to mar to dem to demonstrate and really to see themselves as actors in in history, in creating uh, a political change and historical change. Um, so I think that sort of model of organizing, uh, what uh, Reverend Rivers calls direct action, I think is a really important model that I think is a, something that was demonstrated uh, at, at the March on Washington. Thank you for all of those. It reminds me of, um a quote by Reverend um, Fred Shuttleworth, who Martin Luther King Jr. called the most courageous civil rights fighter in the, in the South. But his quote, the quote is, we're going to march, we're going to walk together, we're going to stand together, we're going to sing together, we're going to stay together, we're going to moan together, we're going to groan together, and after a while, we will have freedom, freedom and freedom now. And that is something that anyone can can stand with, every, anyone and everyone can stand behind, can understand and to join in with. 
Yeah, yeah. And you know, Thank I think you. it was a sort of narrative that was constructed after the march that the mm -hmm. march mobilized lots of people by being kind of focused and narrow. And I think another thing we need to remember about the march is how radical the demands were. They actually got people there because they demanded things that really would make an impact on people's lives and really meant a lot to people. And if we read those lists of demands, um, it's a very powerful list of demands, some of which were met, some of many of which we're still fighting for. And because it happened in 63, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued by, by Lincoln, King and others were able to use the fact that the march itself was rapid. Yeah. To get together in 1963 at the 100th anniversary of this, just 100 years after, quote unquote, enslaved Africans were set to speak to the president and the nation with that kind of boldness was a radical step. And unless you were around at that time, I think it's hard to imagine how radical it was. But looking back, we cannot deny that the courage and the planning the bodaciousness to say, I'm going to go to the seat of government and confront the folk who can. One of the things we learned in direct action, you shouldn't march against the sanitation workers trying to fix sanitation problems. So you, you have to march to where the power sits that can make the change. And that march went to Washington because it was demanding federal legislation to change the condition of people in America. Thank you. So we are at 143 and we're going to transition to uh, Q&A. We have a few questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is, how was the March, March for Jobs and Freedom not only a feat for African-Americans, but also union workers as a whole? Well, I think, I mean, when, when we talk about the union movement being involved in the march, it was primarily Black trade unionists. These were uh, the, the unions that were there at the march and played a role were unions either that were in led by Black workers or had very large numbers of Black workers in their members. Um, and I think in some ways the role of the march was sort of pushing the union movement to change. To uh, This was a union movement that still had unions that would not allow Black people to join them. So part of the demand was to actually allow Black people into these unions. Um, but also to bring Black workers into leadership of the unions. And, and since then, we've seen a tremendous change in the union movement, in the, in the leadership and the representation um, of, of African-Americans and women. The, the largest unions in this nation are now led by women and African-Americans. And that's a change that started in this moment and the, the march had a, had a part of. I think it's absolutely important to underscore what he said about the union chain that we take for granted now. But in 63, the unions didn't look like they look now, no. and they didn't have the courage they have now. For many of them, this was a risk because it involved showing that Black folk were in the unions, and some unions, frankly, did not did not want that. And I talked, had a chance to talk to Mr. Nixon from, from Montgomery about the bus boycott and how the Pullman workers, Pullman car workers were so important to that, but also talking years after the folk in Detroit, they lived in Detroit, and they talk about the march, uh, but it was the lessons they learned in the Detroit march that helped. So yeah, the unionizing uh, of, of America now and the way it looks compared to what it looked in 63, by itself should be credited to the, the success of the march. That's right. Thank you. So another question uh, we received is, uh, is the full list of march demands in Professor Jones' book and uh, uh, just to note that it would be interesting to see the full list um, and would love a link to the book, which I think is uh, up higher in the chat. Yeah, the demands are in the book. Um, the, the, it, it, they're pretty easy to find if you Google demands of March on Washington, uh, you'll find the, the, the National Archives has the, the original material of the March all posted. So it's pretty easy to find. Fantastic. Uh, so I think we may have touched on this, but uh, in regard to the original demands of the organizers, um, were they accomplished immediately following the march over time, or were there some that were never achieved? Yeah, I mean, there's still um, the minimum wage certainly isn't $20 an hour. Um, 
and and there are you know the minimum wage does not apply to all workers. Um, we don't have a federal uh, employment program, which is one of the I think the 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 efforts uh, the one of the objectives of these meetings is to call for federal support to subsidize employment. Um, we don't have nearly the civil rights, the the enforcement, the power of the civil of enforcement of civil rights laws that were demanded by the march is nowhere near what we have, or what we have is nowhere near what they were demanding. I mean, they they you know, as I pointed out, they wanted all schools to be desegregated by 1963. Um, in 1963, um, we schools have become more segregated since then. And one of the things though that the march taught us, or at least it taught me and my part of the movement, is don't give up. Yeah. The march, the, the march made things happen so quickly in relative time that it made people understand the rest of the list could be achieved. Uh, the killing of Kennedy, uh, sad as unfortunate what it was, it was, it literally put a southerner in the White House who understood how to get it done. That was Lyndon Zane Johnson. So in, from 63 to 64 and then 65. The condition of black people in America changed in such a uh, seismic way that we really don't often dwell enough on how different it was post-March and pre-March, a large part because of the success of the march. Um, thanks, Lisa, for putting the, the link in the chat. You can click on to go to this march this year for the continuation. But to your point, uh, Brother Jones, it's important to know that as we fight, we have to look at what was on that list that seemed unreachable that happened in two years, happened in three years, the housing issue in 68, the voting rights in 65. In South, in South Carolina, we went from not being able to go to the public water fountain or go to a water fountain where white people went or go to a restaurant that could bar us because we were black. And in two years, that was gone. That happened because of the march. It also taught us that being bodacious in your request, you should be that. Because if you want it to change, you have to be radical in the request radical in the faith and radical in the outcome. And that's what happened. And the march taught us that because if the march had not happened, we may still be trying to get to go in the dog on McDonald's, the same door that white people go in, but the march helped change all that. And the killing yeah. of the people, the killing of the, the girls, um, the, kill, the lynching of folk all over the South, that, but the march crystallized it in such a way that it made us say that it may not happen in 2023 but we can still work on it to happen in 2024 because look at what they did in 63. Thank you. You know, there are numerous efforts, uh, perhaps most notably in Florida to ban or at least uh, whitewash black American history. Uh, supporters of those uh, attempts claim it's about liberty and freedom of choice uh, for students and parents. Um, I'm curious if you think there are lessons about backlash about efforts to reverse the gains uh, from arising from this march that all America, Americans of all races uh, should know uh, as we approach the anniversary of, um, of this march? Radical action results in radical response. In Alabama, when they killed those girls, it was no question. It was a response to the march the number of lynchings, the number of Klan uprisings that came because the march made it clear that the day of change was closer than many whites were comfortable with. And so they responded with the kind of violence that was designed to stop. It didn't stop, but it cost a lot of lives. And we need to be clear that uh, this approach to education is really the radical response to radical change. Um, Carol, for centuries in America, our, our school system, um, some white churches, politicians have taught that Black people are inferior and that anything that we have acquired in this country comes from the generosity of white people. I think it's important for all Americans to start asking questions and strategic questions. And I would start with the question of what would our country look like if we started from the premise that Black people should have always had the right to be free and that that freedom was snatched, snatched from them. What would, how would our country look different? Americans need to know that no benefit can come 
can be derived from something that comes at the expense of someone else's freedom and the right to self-determination. When we look at the National Black Worker Center, when we look at politicians like DeSantos um, build these platforms on erasing the, the Black experience, we know historically that it doesn't end there. They then move on, if successful, to erasing the histories of other members of society, such as the LGBTQ um, members, um, women, Latinos, Asian, Jewish communities, you name it, right? It reminds me of that quote from Angela Davis, if they come for me in the morning, they will come for you in the night. And so what we have to know, and is the, I would say it's also the beauty of the march is that it was not a monolith. There were people from all generations, from all economic status, from, from different races who came together in coalition and in unity. And that is what it will take for us to overcome these forces that, that seek to disenfranchise us, that seek to keep us disorganized and, and confused. And there was something that Reverend Nelson uh, mentioned earlier today when he talked about um, jobs intentionally not being left out. And I think that he's correct on that. Jobs were not um, discussed after the, the march because the jobs are the things that unify us. Even today, um, there was um, a report out that says that 60% of Americans um, um, are living check to check, 60%. If we allow ourselves to be focused on these false narratives of racism and superiority, that um, prevents us from focusing on the fact that so many of us are in the same boat. It keeps us disorganized and not focused on where the, the real um, fight is and who the real enemy is. And so that is a, a great lesson for, for the march, just the coming together in coalition um, across um, socioeconomic, across race barriers, racial barriers, across um, religion, and just really woke focusing on what is keeping us from being free. Thank you. One, one quick thing on the education piece and changing the books. I'm from a state that in 1835 made it illegal to teach black people to read. And there's a reason for that. And a lot of this is making it illegal to teach white to teach white children the truth about the sordid past of their ancestors and the racism that was invoked in America, but also it was a reason for that is because when you build the truth, you build empathy. And when you get empathy, you get more people for justice than for racism. And since they can't afford to lose any more folk who are fighting on the side of racism, they refuse to get, have empathy included in the curriculum because when children learn no matter their race, to so someone was harmed because of what they look like, they move forward to what that means today. My eight-year-old granddaughter, when she found out that the white white friend of hers who was eight years old, that in those days she would have to work for her and carry her stuff and all of that. When she told the white child about it, and the white child was appalled, she told her mom and daddy, mom, we will never enslave Corinne, I mean, enslave Madison. Well, they don't want that conversation to happen because what that happened that day was the white girl got empathy. She understood that they were there were folk like her mother and father, not them and not her grandparents, but people like them who made it a policy to abuse people like Madison. So when Madison and, and the young girl are talking now, and you, that third grade or fifth grade, that black folk were used just because they were black, that would be offending to them because they grew up in a different time now. That is really what this is about, is about stopping empathy because the way people join the movement without being sympathetic is to become empathetic. When you're empathetic, you have a better, a better partner the one who just feels bad, feels sorry for you. We don't need you to feel sorry for us. We need you to feel sorry for America because we want people to join this, to join this fight to end racism and segregation, mistreatment of folk who are not like us, folk who are worrying about where they sleep, who they sleep with. But that happens by including data, including detail, and not excluding. But they also know that on the other side. That's why they want to exclude it because they don't want their children to be empathetic. Thank you so much, Reverend Rivers. Uh, Will, did you? want to jump in yeah, on that? I mean, I just I would point to the long history of this backlash. I mean, I was actually surprised reading the details of the backlash against the March on Washington. When, 
Um, I think R Reverend Rivers mentioned that, you know, people were attacked on their way home. There, the people were shot. There were people on highway overpasses shooting at the buses on the way home. Um, there were mass marches in uh, Chicago uh, and in California in the days after the march, opposing what was known as open housing, the idea that you should be able to uh, rent or purchase a house regardless of your race. Um, there was a, a white, uh, a, I'm sorry, a black, a young black couple moved into a home in Philadelphia uh, the day mm -hmm. after the march, and they, their neighbors, it was in suburban Philadelphia, their, mar their neighbors surrounded the house and attacked the house until they had to leave uh, and go back to their apartment in the city. Um, this was the day after the March on Washington in Philadelphia. So this is not just the South. Um, California had passed an open housing law. And in the, in the months after the march, there was a proposition in California that overturned that law. So they, they built support to overturn the, op the open housing law in California. This is actually the moment at which Ronald Reagan sort of became got his entry into Cal into California politics. He would later become governor uh, and then president. So I think you know the, this type of backlash is not new, and it really has has always been uh, the response of certain parts of the country to uh, to the demands of you know as King said of of living up to the to the promise of the founding documents of our nation. Well, I want to say uh, thanks so much to each of our panelists. We have uh, just two minutes left. And um, before we uh, end, I did want to note that the commemoration of the March uh, on Washington for Jobs and Freedom will continue next week, Wednesday at 1 p.m. with a panel discussion on the continuing struggle for jobs. If you have not registered, uh, please do so. Thanks again to the Center for Economic and Policy Research uh, and each of our panelists here today. Um, there were a couple of questions in the Q&A that we didn't fully get to. And so I'd like to close by just asking each of you, um, kind of drawing on those questions, what would you say uh, for young people in this time uh, that they should know about the March in Washington for Jobs and Freedom and uh, is there some uh, bit of wisdom that you draw on from that history that you think is relevant for young folks today? We're taking college students and everyone to DC for the March continuation on August 26th. Remember this, the reason so many people are still alive who talk about the March, who say they were participating because the March had a preponderance of young people. They did it then, we invite young people to do it now. This is your struggle now. It's not a history lesson. It's a lesson on how to be effective in making change. Thank you, Reverend Rivers. Tanya. Earlier, Reverend Nelson talked about the immediate changes that took place after the march. And I would remind young people of what has taken place in their generation. And that's the great resignation uh, that happened um, in conjunction um, with, with the, the COVID pandemic, when people stopped going to work, there were things that we thought that we would never get and we were told that we would never receive, such as um, 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 Confederate monuments being taken down throughout the South and throughout the country, such as um, restaurant employees being paid $15,000 an hour, getting um, tuition reimbursement, getting all kinds of advances that we've been told for centuries were ir um, uh, not realistic to have. That great resignation is an example of a movement. It wasn't a march or it wasn't a, a traditional march, right, where it didn't take place in D.C., but it did take place across the country. And so I want um, young people to realize that they have the opportunity right now today to take action and that they are the leaders that they are waiting for. Take note from the history and, and take action. That's what this is all about, uh, for me at least, right? It's, it's not that we just study, but we study, we learn, and we take action and we get to moving. And have these conversations with your friends, with your colleagues, with your family, and talk to them about what they are experiencing um, economically what they're experiencing on their jobs so that people mm -hmm. can, as uh, Reverend Nelson said, become empathetic to what's happening and recognize that there is a solution to the problems that they are facing and that the power 
is at their fingertips and in their feet. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Will? I'd just add that, that encourage people to organize, that these, these are collective activities and people do it at, not as individuals, but as parts of organizations. If you don't have an organization, make one, get your friends together and, and get together and you can really have a tremendous impact. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, I look forward to this continuing conversation next week uh, at 1 p.m. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. In D.C. on the 26th. Looking forward. Come join us.